So let's begin with an understanding of how the Americans with Disabilities Act protects the examinee. Perfect time for you guys to take a break from Ontario if you want to. <laughs> Keep in mind that although I'm talking about the Americans with Disabilities Act, because we have folks here from uh, not only outside of the United States, but also across the United States, and so the common statutory framework is the Americans with Disabilities Act, but there's also the state progeny or the, the counterparts to these broad national statutes, whether it be HIPAA or ADA or FEMLA, they all have state progeny, they all have state counterparts. So it's important that you understand your respective state counterpart to the ADA or to HIPAA or to FEMLA as well. Because the national statute sets the floor with respect to rights and procedural obligations. It does not set the ceiling. So some states have, have progeny that are more restrictive and have it, that, that impose additional procedural demands, which I'll not be talking about today. So I'll only be talking about those that are common across the states, that are federal in nature. And uh, now and then, I'll talk about some specific uh, local ones. We have, how many Californians do we have in the room? All right, so I'll, I'll spend a bit more time on California. But I won't be talking about all of it. So the Americans with Disabilities Act and its state progeny prohibit discrimination against qualified persons with a disability. Now this is very important to grasp this piece of the law. That is, it protects qualified persons with a disability. One of the common misnomers about the ADA is that it protects persons with disabilities. It does not. There are no obligations with, outside of procedural obligations that an employer has towards persons with disabilities. Their obligations outside of the procedural requirements pertain to qualified persons with disabilities. Now, I'm going to jump ahead, and we'll go into the detail later on, that one of the ways in which a person very quickly becomes unqualified is to threaten to kill their supervisor. <laughs> it's not a good thing. Now, let's say that that, person's, that person threatens their supervisor as a product of mental illness. The, so the employer calls you up, says, we want a fitness for duty evaluation. This person has threatened to kill his supervisor, send him an email message, we have a copy of it, uh, it's attached, you confirm it, and uh, you know, we're really scared about whether or not he's going to do this, but, but uh, we'd like you to do a fitness for duty evaluation to decide whether it's fit for duty. Frankly, my advice is you do not want to bring this person back. You want to fire this person, but before you do, because fired people can kill too, in fact, you have less control over them once they're fired. You certainly want to do a risk assessment, and you certainly want to determine uh, how you might be able to mitigate risk. But you want to be very clear from the beginning that this person is not a qualified person. They may have a disability, but they're not a qualified person with a, with a disability. So the game changes. The, 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 the rules change. We'll get into the detail of this a bit later. But keep in mind at all times that the, that the ADA is a non-discrimination act pertaining to persons who are qualified with a disability. I keep telling you, though, that there are procedural obligations that are superior to those concerns, that they apply to all applicants and employees, regardless of whether they're disabled or not. That is not true in every circuit, however. And some circuits haven't yet tested that, and when we get into that portion of the discussion, uh, I'll, I'll bring that up again and make it clear to you how that might impact the interpretation or analysis of ADA obligations in your individual circuits. The ADA also prohibits medical examinations or inquiries of applicants and employees except under specific conditions. These specific conditions 
we generally call threshold considerations or threshold conditions. And we'll detail what those are um, a little bit later. Within the context of pre-employment uh, examinations, all candidates in the job class must receive the evaluation. You can't cherry pick. You can't just say, we're only going to do a pre-employment psychological evaluation on people who have a history of, of mental health treatment, or people who have been deployed to a combat zone, or people who are between the age of 26 and 36. You can't do that. Every applicant in the job class has to be given the examination, uh, of course, after they've been given a conditional offer of employment. And the conditional offer of employment must be real, must be bona fide. Now, I, I, I know agencies, Mike, probably, you know these two in Portland, there are some of them in Oregon, who thought it would be really smart on their part given that you can't do a psychological evaluation until you've given a conditional offer of employment, that they would make a conditional offer of employment when the person came in to pick up an application. Hey, would you like a job? Sure. Here's your application. Consider this a conditional offer of employment, and it's conditioned upon you passing everything after this. That's not a real offer of employment, because the Americans with Disabilities Act set some conditions, some parameters, some threshold considerations for when an offer of employment is real. We'll get into that in a second. So, a conditional offer of employment is not viewed as bona fide or real unless an employer has evaluated all relevant non-medical information, which from a practical and legal perspective could reasonably have been analyzed prior to extending the offer. So what does that mean? Well, obviously, the, the example I gave of offering the, making a conditional offer of employment when the person picks up the application, that doesn't work, does it? That's not a real offer of employment, because they haven't evaluated all non-medical information. They haven't evaluated any non-medical information. They've just given the application out. Now, how many of you conduct pre-employment psychological screening? All right. Three quarter, two thirds of you. And how many of you who do pre-employment psychological screening would say that the judgments that you make about applicants uh, includes, in part, non-medical information? OK. What is non-medical information? Background, family history, personal history, occupational history, non-medical. Certain, certain kinds of family history could be medical in nature. Certain kinds of occupational history could be medical in nature. For example, workers' compensation claims, sick leave use, separations for medical leave. That's medical information. But other parts of it are non-medical. How about um, assessing a person's interpersonal competence? Is that medical or non-medical? Non-medical. Pardon? Non-medical. Non-medical. It could have medical implications, that is, certain, as certain uh, mental conditions do impact or affect uh, interpersonal conduct. But the assessment of the behavior as assertive, dominant, authoritarian, accommodating, those sorts of analyses in and of themselves are non-medical. What makes a, an analysis or data medical versus non-medical? Anybody have any ideas? Linked to clinical diagnosis. Not necessarily linked to clinical diagnosis, but if it is designed to identify a disability or it's capable of revealing the nature or severity or existence of a disability, it would be medical in nature. We'll, we'll, again, we'll detail uh, that a bit more later. So that's pre-employment. Conditional offer of employment must be made before any medical inquiries can be made. And in order for that 
conditional offer of employment to be considered a valid, real, or bona fide offer, all non-medical information must first be gathered that reasonably could be gathered. Now let's skip to post-employment. After a person's hired, they're now an incumbent employee. Any compulsory medical examination must be job relevant and consistent with business necessity. That's the general standard. Well, if you just know that, it's not going to help you much. Because you would think that virtually any time an employer has concerns about an employee, it would be job relevant and consistent with business necessity to have them examined. But it's not. So let's get into the details of that. The employer, in order to meet the business necessity standard, as it's referred to more broadly, the employer must have objective evidence of impaired ability and a reasonable belief that the impairment results from a medical condition. <laughs> or a reasonable belief that the employee poses a direct, self to, a direct threat to self or others as a result of a mental condition. So, said another way, there are two elements. You have to have the objective evidence of impairment or uh, objective evidence that would suggest the person may pose a direct threat and a reasonable belief that it's a result of or influenced by an underlying mental or medical condition. You have to have that linkage. So let's say a person who is, uh, all you know, is that the uh, employer is concerned about a person being terribly rude to citizens. This is a police officer who is behaving very rudely and is getting lots of citizen complaints and uh, isn't being very thoughtful about language, uses some expletives, and um, this is not a change in behavior. This is a change in tolerance. That it's been going on for 16 years and the agency's finally decided that they're tired of it. And the person was like that from the beginning, everyone says. They've always been like that. But they got a new chief or a new sheriff in town and they don't want to tolerate it anymore. Any reason at this point, based on what I've told you, to suggest that this is a result of an underlying medical condition? No. So on the basis of that alone, would you be skeptical about whether you should be doing a fitness for duty evaluation at all? Yes. You should be. You should be. Simply because the employer makes a phone call requesting a fitness for duty evaluation should not be sufficient for you to do one. Uh, a client who calls my office to make an appointment can make an appointment for that is an agency, can make an appointment for any purpose through my assistant except for a fitness for duty evaluation. That's going to require a conversation with me first. So when we get to that piece of our discussion today, we'll talk about the pre-referral conference and the importance of that in uh, conducting fitness for duty evaluations. Now, all of this is because of statutory protections that are afforded an employee. Not simply because it's ethically a good idea or because that's my experience of what I think we should be doing. It's because the statute tells us plainly and the case law consistently reminds us that these protections are significant national standards that require compliance. 